All right. Hello, LinkedIn. Hello, folks. <laughs> it's it's been a fun morning already. Yeah, like I said, I love LinkedIn. <laughs> Incredible Rough technology. Start. Yeah, we're just gonna go ahead and get that out of the way. Uh, grab a cup of coffee. We are going to dive right in because we're running a little bit late under this this format, so not a big issue. Everybody, uh, always hit that share button, man. Send the share button out. Click like. Click the hearts. Do everything you can possibly do for Dallas and I, and let's get this out uh, to everybody. So with that, Dallas, let's dive right in. All right. Um, All right. So hello, everybody. Welcome to the 28th episode of FinTech Insider, The Breakfast Show US. I'm Sam All. I'm the 11FS Managing Director for North America. I'll be your host for the morning show. Let us know you're watching from. We'd love to hear from our viewers. We'd love to know where you're based. We've had folks from Egypt, Philippines, Istanbul, Lord, um, Germany, Ireland, take your pick, all over the world, Africa. Um, share the stream, please hit the like button and please subscribe to 11FS on LinkedIn so you'll never miss a show. Today, we're very happy to be joined by Dallas Wells. He's the SVP of Strategic Innovation at Precision Lender, which is a Q2 company, which yes, we'll explain. All right, you're gonna need like a, <laughs> you know, you're gonna need, you know, it's one of those- There's a decision tree in there somewhere. Amen. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so we're gonna talk about the importance of the Main Street Lending Program and why bankers should participate in it. All right, uh, Dallas, one, Dallas and I talked about this right before the call. Dallas, you're in St. Louis, right? That's correct. All right, so Dallas is in St. Louis. He works for Q2 eventually, which um, is a Texas-based company. It was destiny that Dallas would work <laughs> for this organization. You know what I love Inevitable. about your name? Yeah. yeah, Dallas, I love your name because it sounds like a character on like Magnum PI. You know, your parents. Yeah, it's not nearly so cool, but um, but oh. it does sound like it could be, right? It is a great, it beats Samuel <laughs> Earl Mall. I'm going to be blunt. Uh, <laughs> it had a better ring to it, and I blame my parents for that. Um, All right, so so Dallas, good luck. But can you explain who Precision Lender is and what is the tie to Q2 and who Q2 is? Sure. So um, Precision Lender is a pricing and profitability software. Uh, we were founded in 2009, so we were coming out of the last crisis when this thing was founded. Um, went at it about a decade, and then we were acquired by Q2 uh, November 1st of last year. So right before the next crisis started. Wow. Um, so, so Q2 is an online banking platform and um, has done several acquisitions over the last few years and um, is really now stitching together what, what they're calling a um, FinEx, so financial experience for customers. So kind of end to end everything from online banking to onboarding to uh, LOS system um, to what we do, which is kind of um, pricing, negotiating, structuring complex commercial deals. So that's Precision Lender. And and it actually, it makes sense, right? For a company like you too. And, and we're seeing this more and more where uh, you kind of build out the entire ecosystem, right? That's so right. You yep. can provide the full service suite um, for your, for your customer base and that vertical. So, it makes sense. Yeah. I love I love that y'all started coming in 2009. Now this acquisition came right before this one. Um, yeah. So Dallas, I'll ask from your standpoint, um, how different does it feel right now for what we're going through as compared to 2009? You know, there there was lots of things that um, that felt very similar, um, and, and I think one of the things is we're we're still kind of digesting. Yeah. Is is that banks are, at least a lot of the banks are kind of slow motion, figuring out how bad this is going to be, how painful this is going to be for them. Um, it was surprising to me, you know, when, when the shutdowns first started and, and banks had to start sending employees home, um, you were already like two or three weeks into it, seeing all kinds of, of you know, blog posts and articles and stuff out in the, um, out in the industry talking about what have we learned from this, right? What are we going to do different next time? And it's like next time, we're you know we're still like <laughs> midair from falling off the cliff. We don't, we don't know where the bottom of this thing is yet. And so that that part reminded me of of the financial crisis where, um, you know, the, it started with these like hedge fund blowups early in in two thousand eight, and people were like, wow, that's a little weird. That's a little strange that you know. And the, it was like these little blips in the market. And then by the time we got to the fall. Um, everybody was kind of looking around like, is the system going to survive this? Yeah. So, so that's the similarity has been just kind of the slow, um, 
realization, I think, of that there's real risk, there's real repercussions coming to this, to, to bank balance sheets. And this is, the difference is that one was a financial crisis. I think this one becomes a true credit issue. You know, it's Main Street, street customers um, that, are, that are dealing with this and that are gonna land as problems on banks' books. This is not esoteric derivatives, it's not CDOs, it's not, you know, the big investment banks only, it's not AIG and um, all of that kind of stuff. It is mom and pop businesses, it's people unemployed, you know, it's kind of classic recession stuff that um, it's been a while since banks have had to deal with. There's a lot of bankers that haven't seen this before. So yeah, um, lots of things that rhyme, but also lots of things that are just fundamentally different from last time around. Yeah, it'll be interesting when they eventually make the movie about this from a financial services standpoint. Um, and I'm yeah. trying to remember the big, uh, what was the movie with Matthew McConaughey and all those that came out of the last one where they were explaining CBOs and everything else. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and literally, I mean, it was tough. Half, you know, most of that movie was them explaining financial terms um, and, yeah. and, you know, kind of how the housing market crashed and, and, um, and the big short, the big there short. Tobias. Yeah, there you go. Tobias in, in Sweden just whispered in my ear, which is very interesting because you all couldn't hear that. But the, if you think about how the big short was made, a lot of that movie was explaining very detailed and technical terminology of what led to it. This one, it's, it's very straightforward. Uh, you know, how, do, yeah. how does the business survive when it's shut down for business for two months at a shot? Yeah, I, th I think it's much easier to understand, um, but but that doesn't make the make it any less no. uncertain. You know, the I think what banks are struggling with right now is is when this started, it felt like this is a temporary thing. It's a liquidity issue, right? Get yeah. liquidity in the hands of our customers, and and in six eight weeks, all is well. Um, you don't you don't in the U.S. We're looking at you know thirty plus million jobs already lost, the unemployment rate of you know closing in on fifteen percent. That stuff doesn't just go back overnight, and yeah. so uh, now you're talking about solvency issues, and and banks are having to help decide which of their small business customers survive this, you know, who, who gets the lifeline and who doesn't. And, and, and that's the part that um, after the chaos of triple P, I think banks are starting to wrestle with is now what? Yeah. Uh, yeah. We've talked about uh, the payroll protection program um, almost daily on this show. Yeah. Um, again, you're talking about something that was built on the fly. Uh, we're in the, the second round of this and um you know, Dallas, we were talking right before this, it's interesting to start to see some of these small businesses and their behavior around PPP, where there's a, a segment of, you know, this group that's like, you know, it's not worth me taking this money. It, it's, yeah. it, it doesn't benefit me. You know, I'm better off just shutting down and restarting because of the, the turn. Like you said, there's no such thing as free money. Yeah. Yeah. There's always, there's always a, a price to pay. And I think what people are figuring out is it's, it's scrutiny. It's there's like some legal reputational risk for the banks and for the borrowers. And, you know, the, that maybe it's just not worth it. And especially if, you know, that, that thing was designed by its very nature to be two and a half months long. That's how yeah. all the math is geared is 2.5 times payroll. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think everybody's looking at, well, at the end of two and a half months, do I have to pay it back? Do I not? And even if I don't have to pay it back, I now effectively have the federal government on my cap sheet as a, you know, an interested observer in my business. Maybe that's not worth it. <laughs> so uh, Jim Young just commented, he's the director of content at Precision Lender. He said, I have an Arctic Monkeys poster over my shoulder. So I have instant credibility. Jim, I am doing this from my <laughs> daughter's bedroom, my 17 year old daughter's bedroom. So it's this borrowed has, credibility. It's not really saying yeah, <laughs> it says, this. This sounds a lot like the PPP program. All right. I have Green Day behind me. I do know who Green Day is. I do like the Arctic Monkeys, but it's my daughter's room. I don't have credibility. So, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> um, yeah. So Dallas, let's dive in a, a little bit more on Precision Lender and specifically yeah. the services you provide your customer base. Can you talk about that a little bit? Sure. So um, if you think of a typical commercial deal, um, so there's, and, and we also always have to tend to talk in systems, right? So there's, yeah. there's kind of the business development that, that happens inside of a CRM and where your bankers are living in Salesforce or a few in Microsoft um, uh, Dynamics. Um, but where, where you're doing business development, you are keeping track of customers and eventually that, that turns into a real potential transaction. And that's where Precision Lender um, becomes a, a part of the process. So 
this is where your bankers are working with customers. We tend to do um, middle market type transactions. Um, so they're big enough where a banker is touching them. They're negotiating every piece of it. They're structuring it, you know, deals from a couple hundred thousand dollars to a couple hundred million dollars. And so Precision Lender guides the bankers through structuring those deals to be profitable, um, to manage risk, uh, to meet all the banks, you know, um, internal procedures and processes. So we have a virtual coach that lives inside a Precision Lender that helps walk bankers through that. So it's basically to negotiate a good, solid, profitable deal with the customer, including cross-selling and getting credit partners involved and all that kind of complicated stuff that happens with a commercial transaction. Once a deal's live, then it's then it's analytics, it's portfolio management, it's measuring profitability, um, it's monitoring for events that that banker needs to be aware of and notifying them, and helping just manage that customer relationship going forward. And so, so when you talk about your your customers, your clients, um, can you kind of give me a range, right? Are we talking uh, largest banks in the U.S.? Are we talking community mm -hmm. banks, credit unions? What's the typical? Uh, precision lender. We've got, client. yeah, we've got some from across the spectrum there. So we've got a couple of community banks that are less than a hundred million in total assets. Um, and we've got um, one that's closing in on 2 trillion in assets. So runs the full <laughs> gamut, um, do some stuff internationally too. So uh, that, that makes our day to day pretty interesting because you go from the, um, you know, inbound questions, support things, strategy calls with a, you know, two hundred million dollar bank in rural Oklahoma, right? Where there's five yeah. loan officers total, and um, maybe they'll do two Main Street loans once the program's live. Um, and then you've got the the giant money center banks who are trying to figure out how to make a, a an actual program, almost a, a separate business line out of this. And so there's you know wildly different approaches to that and different problems to be solved with that. And 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 for those watching this, uh, this. Uh, it's interesting because Dallas, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, your background, you you worked for some pretty smaller banks back in the day, right? That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I was a I was the CFO of a um, small bank, about 300 million in assets in rural Missouri. Yeah. So you do things you can get um, and then started doing consulting after that. Um, and and now most of my meetings tend to skew with the with the larger clients or, or who I have spent most of my time with over the last couple of years. The, the sort of core fundamental problem that you're solving is exactly the same. Um, you know, you're, you're still trying to offer the same types of products to solve the same kind of problems for the same kind of customers. It's just that there's more zeros involved with the, with the bigger ones and, and all the extra just like organizational complexity that comes with that. So most of the extra issues that you deal with with the bigger um, institutions are uh, their, their necessities, but they're self-inflicted right? Yeah. Extra layers of approval and process and the math is more complicated mm -hmm. and you have to roll it out to 5,000 users instead of five, you know, so just organizational things is, is the difference. But the business th things are basically the same. You know, and what I have found is I've been doing consulting now since about 2011 um, with some of the largest banks in the world. Um, and I think one of the Surpri not surprising, but one of the underlying issues you run into with incredibly large organizations. So let's say you're a bank that is not only here in the US, but you're in Europe, right? And Asia um, and in multiple mm -hmm. markets. It, decision inertia is a real thing. Um, and, and, it's yeah. almost, and it gets bigger and bigger the larger the company, right? Uh, the, the complexity to make a decision, uh, the ownership to make that decision to overcome inertia is really, really tough. Um, yeah, and if, and if that's true, and you're a small uh, community bank, shame on you. By the way, yeah. <laughs> that's a distinct yeah. advantage. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, that's what you should be good at, right? Is is be nimble and, and quick. I'll give you a, what I think is an interesting example. We do lots of math inside of our software, and so um, we we started working with smaller banks, and so we we calculate risk adjusted returns on a deal. So it's risk adjusted return on risk adjusted capital is technically what we're measuring. And we called it ROE on the screen because it's easy to read and that's yeah. a flavor of what it is. So we show it there and community banks would ask, you know, is that risk adjusted return? Yeah, that's what it is. Okay, got it. We'll tell everybody ROE means risk adjusted return. We start rolling this out for one of the, the biggest banks in the world and they're like, you got to change that on the screen. So we go to our usual spiel of, 
well, that's what it means. It's ROE, right? Close enough. And they're like, no, you don't understand. We've had a thousand meetings with hundreds of different people. You know, we've spent tens of thousands of hours all agreeing on exactly what the terms are going to be. You got to make them what they are. Because otherwise, if you want to change them and call it ROE, I got to have another thousand meetings. Yeah. It's just not worth it. So like, okay, we, we get it. Those are the sorts of things that we have to make. So now there's, you know, um, these these crazy acronyms that um, each big bank can put in there to call it what they want to call it. And then you have it, to, you have to learn to basically speak a different language, right? You, you have to translate it to their. Yeah. Understanding a large organization's taxonomy. Um, I'm just proud of myself. I use taxonomy in the right. That was good. Uh, yeah. Right. The right. Class <laughs> to state. But that is a skill set is, is understanding an incredible, I don't care what business you're in, right? That, that goes yeah. across verticals. It's just not banking insurance. Yeah. Oh my God, go work with an insurer. Um, <laughs> but, but it's true in every industry on when the larger you get this, the more unique your taxonomy gets to your organization. And I have seen folks that have excelled not only with the, with the taxonomy, but the processes of how you get stuff done and moved. Yeah. Um, those people that can navigate the waters in very large organizations are worth their weight in gold by the way, Absolutely. But, it, yeah. but it also doesn't translate all the time when they leave and go to another organization because that's tribal knowledge that gets lost. Um, yeah, good point. Because, yeah, it's just like it's rolling out solutions from one geo to another, right? Just because it works, yeah. just because M-Pesa worked in, in parts of Africa does not mean that it works in other parts of Africa or the US or in Europe, yeah. right? I mean, it's a unique solution uh, to that place. So that, um, you know, that's something to apply. We had a good question come in from Dan. Dan's uh, in London. Um, he's he, Evidently, he's an expat over there. He asked, how wide is the divide between Wall Street and Main Street back in the U.S.? Um, I'll give my opinion. Then, Dallas, I'll throw to you since you have that mm -hmm. full gamut. Um, it's, I think, uh, especially through this COVID crisis, that gap's going to get wider, um, but in, in, in different ways, right? Um, I think when it came to PPP, um, what the large banks were able to do um, for their large, let's, let's be blunt, larger uh, and more uh, cash rich um, clients was one thing. And what community banks and credit unions and smaller banks have had to do is a little bit of a different flavor. So um, hopefully the gap won't get wider, but Dallas, you service both. So how would you answer that? Yeah, I think there's, there's absolutely a gap that is widening there. Uh, I thought it was pretty telling that the Fed, when they rolled out this program, they they named it the Main Street Lending Program, and, <laughs> and I think they are very they're very Sorry. intentionally trying to say like, you know, look, this is this is a bank run program, but this is this is not for Wall Street. That's what they're trying to say, right? That's what they're yeah. signaling, um, and debatable whether or not that's actually the case, and. And you know the w one other thing on that note that you mentioned as um, especially the larger banks got quite a bit of flack for who they shepherded through these triple P programs yeah. and into some of those loans in, in the first round of it. There there was a few articles that were criticizing and saying that these big banks set up basically a concierge service for their best customers, where they contacted them, said, "Hey, we think you might qualify. Here's what you should do, and and here's how you maximize the money and all that." Um, and, and I think a lot of the smallest businesses and borrowers are really offended by that. Right. And, and there was an outcry about it. I think some of those larger banks actually saw that as an advertisement though, for their middle market and bigger borrowers, that that was basically proof that, Hey, we're going to look out for you. We're going to take care yeah. of our good, good customers. And they probably took that as a positive. So, so that's where I think you see the divide is, um, you know, the, the big businesses, small businesses is, is kind of the same as wall street, main street, and I think you have some big banks that are saying, maybe we're okay with being cozy with some of these customers and being known as the ones who will look out for them. You know? Yeah. yeah it's, I find it interesting. I think we've seen this as we go through, we went through round one and then round two of PPP. And I, I don't know if we'll have a round three. I, I'm anticipating we will. Um, but you think about the loan amounts, right? Um, I'm going to get my haircut tonight. Thank God. Um, nice haircut, by the way. <laughs> um, Thanks. I did this myself. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you, you did it. Yeah. It's very uh, nice and tight. Uh, my <laughs> wife will not allow me to do that. Right. Um, I am not allowed yeah. to buzz my hair. So I just think this in, but yeah. Oh, uh, good for you. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it looks incredible. It looks like I have a very nice, massive um, mound of hair on my head. The reality is 
I have hair everywhere except for like one spot in the back, which looks like the Grand Canyon. It just dips down and my bald spot is so accentuated right now. So I'm getting my hair cut tonight. In Florida, they opened up um, hair salons uh, with a lot of uh, restrictions on them and processes. So I'm going tonight though to get my, my hair cut by the guy that's been cutting my hair forever. Um, the amount that they needed from PPP as compared to say a lot of large bankings, large bank customers, is it's very different, yeah. right? You're not looking for a, a half a million dollar loan or a, you know, even a hundred thousand dollar loan. You know, they're talking like twenty five thousand dollars, you know, right. um, for, a, you know, a, and, and something, you know, there's a vast percentage of these small businesses that are mom and pop stores, meaning they have one or maybe maybe one uh, employee, you know, so the right. amount that they needed to float, um, you know, for, for them was completely different than I'd say some of the larger banks. So yes, there is a divide, but there's also a divide in the customer base. And yeah, absolutely. What I've seen. So yeah, there you go. So so what did you all do um, with respect when we talk about the Main Street Lending Program? Um, yeah. For you, um, it, a, a lot of of companies, you know, spun out solutions very very fast or engaged the customers very very fast. Since you're very good at math or maths for our <laughs> European audience, um, you know, what's yeah. life been been like for you for the past two months? You shipping code like crazy. So <laughs> So we we have um, the the volume on our platform has been really interesting. It's been huge, right? It's yeah. it's spiked up where it's it's massive. Um, but when you subtract out triple P, there's nothing really left. Um, banks are not doing non government guaranteed loans right now um, to speak of, right? There there's a few here and there, and there's renewals, and there's there's a few things that they got to do. But for the most part, it's triple P or nothing. Um, so we didn't have a ton to do to, you know, we don't, we don't do directly customer facing stuff. So we had to connect to a few other systems and, and help with some kind of um, uh, connecting things there. We had had to start getting ready for the main street program. Um, and that one, you know, the banks are putting real dollars out. They, they decreased the loan size. The minimum loan size on that is half a million dollars, but it goes all the way up to $200 million. So some of these are sizable. Um, the bank keeps between five and 15% of that exposure. So they have real credit risk. The assumption is, is that if you're doing main street lending, it's a problem customer, right? There, there's an issue there that you're, um, that you're willing to tangle yourself up with, uh, with one of these programs to help solve. So big dollars, big potential risk. Um, and they're very, um, uh, it's a dictated structure, right? You, this is exactly how you have to structure these loans. They have four year maturity, they have um, dictated pricing and fees. And so you have to check all those boxes um, and, and all that has to be right for you to be able to sell the exposure back to the federal reserve. So um, I think that's the biggest challenge for the banks is number one, make sure that they dot all those I's cross all those T's that the deal gets put in the right kind of bucket structured the right way. And then at the very end of that, you actually have to decide, are we better off from doing this, right? Uh, are we in a better position? Is our customer in a better position? Um, they have to repay all of this, right? We have a tiny bit of the exposure, but the customer's on the hook for the whole thing. And if they default, now you've got the Federal Reserve as an interested party trying to collect that, right? So that's going to change some some things on the back end of that. And so I think that's why banks are being cautious about it. Um, and, and that's what most of our building has been about is to, uh, to help sort through that complexity and have bankers who are like, look, here's the, here's the reality, right? We're, we're here streaming this from our own homes. Um, bankers are sitting in their living rooms with the dog on one side and a kid crawling over them on the other side. And they have customers calling them on their, on their cell phone saying, you know, for these middle market customers, I need 5 million bucks, right. To survive yeah. for the next round of inventory for payroll, whatever. And these bankers have to try to navigate now, you know, five, six different government programs on top of the internal forbearance things that the banks are putting together. You got to find the right spot for your borrower. That, that's the best for them. That's the best for the bank to where you can get them what they need quickly um, in, in the most efficient way. It's, it's a challenge. And so that, that's what we're trying to help with, but it's, um, it's tricky and the rules change every day. So um, it'll be interesting to see how all this comes together over the next few weeks. Yeah, that, and that's actually been one of my favorite questions um, that I, I think now I pose to every guest. I kind of do this at the end, which is, uh, what do you think we're going to take away from this? What's going to be 
the big surprise, right? Um, I'm coming out of, when I say coming out of this, I'm talking like 2022, right? I'm not right. talking next month. Um, and I think this has a long tail. Um, wh what do you think is, is going to change? Like we saw this coming out of 2008, uh, you know, FinTech really uh, coming into its own online lenders, right? Mm -hmm. That we hadn't seen before really came out of the last crash that we went through. Um, you know, I, I, you know, for example, uh, restaurants, right? Mm -hmm. um, especially in heavy hit areas, think about New York, right? Oh, yeah. um, or, or Philly, um, or London and Paris, just the whole restaurant vertical and what it's going through right now. Um, which by the way, is a completely different story than other states. You live in St. Louis where you haven't seen an, an impact like, like New York has gone through. Right. Um, but, but what do you, what do you think is going to be surprising? And I think I tie this back to, you know, it's what you all do when we're talking about lending. Yeah. And banks. So I think there's two big things that we are seeing. Um, I'll, I'll tackle the, the easier one first. And I say easier, just easier to describe. Um, it's not an easy solution for banks, but everything they do to monitor credit, and I shouldn't say everything, but the vast majority of the way they measure and monitor credit risk is backwards looking, right? So you gather yeah. last quarter's financial statements, you get them maybe 45 days after the end of the quarter, you send them to your analysts, they review them and you see, is all well or should we downgrade them? Should we ask for more collateral? Should we adjust anything? All that is looking backwards. And if you look at what banks have in their hands right now, you know they're like maybe through February, they haven't seen any of the actual risk. So what banks are trying to figure out is how do we know today, number one, who's in trouble, right? Who, who needs help right now today that um, some of them are calling and asking, but not all of them are. So they're trying to figure out how do we measure cash burn and how do we look at who's drawing up lines of credit and you know how do we just see who's having a, a crunch right now? And then how do we have to, instead of looking backwards, we have to look on a pro forma basis. Going forward, who can survive this? And that goes into kind of your point about, you know, yeah. it, it's very different for different verticals, right? The oil and gas company, the restaurants, those, those are in real trouble. Um, the, the delivery company, maybe not, right? So, you know, they could be having cash crunches for different reasons and banks are having to shift from backwards looking, lend based on what you can know and verify to forward looking and have to try to lend and make some pretty painful decisions based on what you think is gonna happen. So it's just a different, it's a different muscle. The second thing um, is that that we've in our discussions with banks, and this has really surprised me. I don't know why. I should have I should have maybe known this, but it's been surprising. You expect with everyone being remote um, and with the data needs for the things that I just talked about, that it it would be um, a big push for lots of new technology, right? That it would be all yeah. digital things are are a requirement now. And I think that's the long term answer, but in the interim banks have reverted to like it's 1995 in the commercial part of the bank. They have command and control. We're going to have daily conference calls. We're going to talk about what we're seeing in the marketplace, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. We're going to email you a desk sheet. You know, if you remember terminology like that, we want you to print this thing out and set it on your desk. Because they are, um, they know that there's a ton of risk out there and they want to kind of purposely slow down and evaluate it and have human eyes on it, have management's eyes on it. And so I think what's going to need to happen, as you're talking about, as we slow motion play through this and we get to, you know, a couple of years out probably, what changes is, is banks have to figure out how to get that monitoring, closely held decision making kind of digital system. Scale doesn't work. Work, it's not sustainable. So they have to take these kind of paper, people heavy manual processes that they're building on the fly to survive this and figure out how to get those up uh, or the data. So employees can do it and not just the executives. And yeah. um, and I think I think it's a whole new set of challenges. We've been in a, a decade of where it was all about revenue and cross selling and expansion. And so now we have to go back to managing risk and we have to go back to process and procedure and checklists and, you know, being cautious. And um, I think that's a new set of systems. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to me that um, uh, it, it, it is that analogy. Every, every speaker at a conference loves doing this. They, they show the car with the rear view mirror, right? Yeah. This ability to <laughs> see what's coming up. And the reality is, 
Um, it's a blend of that, but also with the ability of sensors and everything else to see around the corner, right? And blend the two together. So I think that's more the reality. All right. So believe it or not, folks, we are out of time. Um, Dallas, what's the best place for folks to learn more about Precision Lender and what you guys are up to? Yeah, precisionlender.com. Um, we've been putting out a kind of data-based content about what we're seeing in the industry. If you're curious, check that out. Uh, we've got a webinar coming up about uh, Main Street Lending Program on the 20th. So precisionlender.com will get you more information on all that stuff. All right, uh, folks, uh, Dallas, thanks for joining. Again, great name, Dallas. Dallas <laughs> man. So. Yeah. It's character and a magnum PI. I could just see it. All right, everybody, thanks for being here. Tomorrow I'll be joined by one of my favorite people, Laura Spikerman, one of the co-founders of Alloy. Again, if you know someone who'd be great for the show, reach out to me, uh, Sam Mall on Twitter, or you can email us at podcast at 11 scom Thanks for the great question, as always, everybody, and being engaged so much. Love having you here. Dallas, you have a great day. Everyone else, we'll see you tomorrow.